Hi there, welcome to my new series, uh, One Question Leads to Another, um, each one of these episodes, which don't follow any particular order, are based on questions either that I've asked myself or I've asked other people with limited success. So in other words, it's based on a question and not necessarily on a language point. If you have any questions that you think I might have something to say about, please put them in the comments below. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, can you click the like and subscribe buttons? Okay. This episode doesn't have a specific language point at all, apart from the fact that I'll be uh, speaking in English and those of you who are studying English might find some of the vocabulary interesting. Let's get to the question. Why do planes board from the left side? If you look at this image, you can see that the passengers are boarding from the left side. Okay, for you it's the right side, but from the plane's point of view, it's the left side. Yeah, I know planes don't have a point of view, but you know what I mean. Anyway, why is this? There's a perfectly good door on the other side of the plane where supplies are delivered. Airplanes are by nature symmetrical. There are doors and hatches, etc. on both sides. So why? If you Google this question, you'll see the following answer. It goes like this. Early ships, and here I'm talking about medieval ships, had a rudder or a tiller, which was basically a long oar, as you can see in this diagram. And this was on the right side of the ship and not in the center as later ships had them. This was actually much easier to build. So when this type of ship docked at a port or a jetty, as you can see here, the side away from the tiller was the side that connected to the land and this left the tiller free to move. The side of the ship with the tiller was known as the starboard side of the ship. The other side, which connected to the land, was known as the port side because it connected to the port. So port was left when facing forward on the ship and starboard was right. So far, so logical. In centuries past, the convention was that ships docked in any port on the port side. In other words, on the left side. The theory is this, that when civil aviation came into play, they followed the same conventions as ships. And I think this could be true, up to a point. It's also true that in the early days of civil aviation, passenger planes arrived as close as possible to the terminals. This was true, for example, at the first London airport, which was based in Croydon in the south of London. And obviously, as the captain of the plane was on the left side of the plane, or perhaps I should say the port side, if I want to be pedantic, he, and it was normally a he in those days, could make sure that the wings of the plane did not hit the terminal building. And this indeed may be true. There is also a theory that passengers arrive on the left side of the plane because baggage, fuel, etc. is loaded on the right side. But as I said before, planes are symmetrical, so this could work in either direction. So why do passengers arrive on the left? This explanation ignores the fact that aviation existed for almost 20 years before civil aviation started. And so while this may be true to a certain extent, this convention probably reinforced a practice that already existed. And I tend to think that this explanation is not complete. So why did early pilots mount their planes from the left? The explanation that I'm about to give you was told to me by a group of engineers from the Airbus company based in Toulouse in France. When I heard this explanation, I should have realised, considering my ancestry in the sense of the fact that my grandfather was a cavalryman at the beginning of the 20th century. In order to understand the early years of aviation, we really need to understand the First World War. Here you can see a British cavalryman at the time. This was a period in which the cavalry were going through an enormous transition. Effectively, in the British Army, it had become a highly mobile infantry unit that travelled to the point of battle on horseback and then dismounted to fight. 
In order to understand the situation, we really need to understand the massive transition that cavalry was going through in the early 20th century, and indeed the late 19th century. My grandfather, like his brothers, was a professional soldier, not an officer, you understand, a trooper. While his brothers were all infantrymen, he loved horses and managed to transfer to the cavalry. And in fact, when war broke out, he was already in the army. On being transferred to France, he found himself idle behind the lines, and for the first 18 months, or maybe two years of the First World War, there was a belief that the breakthrough would be exploited by cavalry. In other words, heavy artillery and infantry would break open a hole in the enemy front, and enormous numbers of cavalry would break through and cause havoc behind enemy lines. This indeed happened, but at that time it was an idea ahead of its time. A quick word about our perceptions of the First World War. The lions led by donkeys idea was like many other media generated myths. Just that, a myth. That can be a subject of a totally different video. In 1916, the British authorities understood that they could no longer continue to maintain such an enormous cavalry presence behind the lines in France when there was little prospect of breaking through. In 1918, the intelligent combination of artillery, tanks, aircraft and cavalry finally created the breakthrough and was the inspiration for Blitzkrieg tactics used later by Nazi Germany. I think it's quite ironic that the um, blitzkrieg tactics used in the early years of the Second World War were invented by British generals 20 years earlier. Um, and these were the donkeys that people said uh, were totally incompetent. However, coming back to 1916, it was decided that the enormous numbers of cavalrymen who were effectively mounted infantry could be exploited much more productively elsewhere. Most of them were converted into infantry. Some of them transferred to tank formations. In fact, if you look at these guys nowadays, you see that when they are not doing ceremonial duties on horseback, they are driving iron horses or tanks. They're doing the job of cavalry. My grandfather was one of the few lucky ones. He was allowed to keep his horse and move to Egypt, where he participated in the invasion of the Ottoman Empire beginning in 1918, and finished his war in Damascus. However, there were other cavalrymen, especially officers, who chose to transfer to the Royal Flying Corps. Lots of cavalrymen made this choice for obvious reasons, that the air war was in fact the new cavalry. So they mounted their planes in the same way as they mounted their horses. Let me explain. I don't know how many times you have mounted a horse. I have done so on several occasions, in fact many occasions, and I, like most people, am right-handed. So in other words, my right hand and my right arm are the stronger than the left. If you want to mount a horse, it makes sense for me to use my right hand to grab the saddle, probably the pommel, and pull myself up using my left foot in the stirrup and my stronger right foot to launch over that of the horse onto the other side. Why is this important? Well, because horses are like people. Some are nice, some are confused, some of them have an evil sense of humour and love to see you lying in the mud. This means that a cavalryman always mounted from the left, and as a consequence, when they mounted their new horses, the airplanes, also they've mounted from the left, not just in the British, but also the French, German, Russian armies, etc. The majority of these pilots were cavalrymen or had some horse riding background because they had the same skill sets that were needed in the air, fast reflexes. And so the transfer from the horse to the fighter plane was the most natural thing in the world. So for me, this is at least part of the answer. Of course, we will never know for sure. Okay, bye for now.